Good evening, everyone. This is Pastor Sarah, and I hope that wherever you are this evening that you are comfortable, that you're hanging in there. This is certainly a way of doing church differently, but I am grateful that we're able to come together and worship this evening. Tonight's scripture reading is Psalm 23, which many of us are familiar with. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The word of God for the people of God. Today's sermon is entitled, Nothing to Fear. And I want to start by reading a few more Bible verses for you all. Genesis 15, 1, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your very great reward. Numbers 21, 34. The Lord said to Moses, do not be afraid of him, for I have delivered him unto your hand. Joshua 8, 1, then the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Matthew 1, 20, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Luke 1, 30, but then an angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. Matthew 28, 5, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. Do you know what I have never once found helpful when I'm afraid? Being told not to be afraid. That has never once been useful to me. Honestly, the times in my life where I have been most scared and most anxious, and there have been some dark moments, it has not been helpful for someone to tell me not to feel how I'm feeling. And I usually find it unhelpful because I've already tried. Sarah, do not fear. Oh, thank you. Why didn't I think of that? I should just not be scared. Wonderful idea. Because if I could just not be afraid, if I could just snap my fingers and change my emotions, I would have already done that, right? When people have said that to me, it feels dismissive of my emotions. I didn't choose to be scared. I don't want to be scared. And yet, here I am, feeling scared. That's not to say I haven't needed someone to calm me down before. That has happened. There have been times when I've been so wound up, so anxious, so panicked that I needed someone to remind me to take a breath. Slow down. Most of the time, though, when I feel scared, I can't just shut it off. So what do I do as a pastor with all of those verses that say, do not be afraid? What do I do with the hundreds, and there are hundreds of scriptures that say that we shouldn't worry and we shouldn't have fear. That's the question this morning. What do we do with fear? I imagine I'm not the only pastor asking that this morning, not the only Christian, not even the only person with that thought in their mind, because the reality of the situation is that a lot of us are pretty freaked out about what's going on. And people who aren't just a little bit freaked out maybe aren't paying enough attention or following the proper protocols, right? Everybody stay home. Wash your hands. That's my PSA of the day. It's a worrisome time 
for many of us. I'm not the only person who's anxious about parents and grandparents and friends. I'm not the only one who's worried for our healthcare professionals. I'm not the only one who knows someone who has gotten sick with coronavirus. I said this during last week's sermon and I'm going to say it again. You're allowed to feel your feelings. You don't have to squash down your emotions. Fear is actually a pretty normal human response to what's going on. Fear, in my opinion, is a deeply human emotion. In fact, fear is part of what has kept humans alive for this long, our ability to be scared of things that are a threat to us. So why in the world does God tell us not to be afraid if it's such a human emotion? Why does God tell us not to be afraid over and over and over again? I want to suggest that it's not about trying to suppress our emotions. It's not about ignoring our fear. It's about not letting fear consume us. Did any of you ever watch that TV show, Lost? I was a big fan of it in high school. The premise is basically that there's a group of people who are stranded on an island after an airplane crash. And if you haven't watched that, you know what? This could be a good time. There's lots of episodes. Could be a good thing to bitch watch. Just don't come at me about the finale. I don't want to talk about it. I'm still mad after all these years. Now, one of the characters on Lost is a doctor, Dr. Jack Shepard. And he has this strategy for when he's afraid or panicking. He lets himself fully feel that fear, fully be consumed by panic for five seconds. He freaks out for a count of five. And then he goes on doing whatever he needs to do to save a person's life or to help out one of the islanders to respond to what's going on. Now, I'm not that good. When I'm scared, I need way more than five seconds to actually feel and process it. But it's the idea, right? The idea that we don't have to be consumed by our fear. We can feel afraid. We can feel anxious and We don't have to let it control us. As people of faith, there are many things we can do in the face of fear. In addition to counting to five, we can pray. We can read scripture. We can pick up the phone and call one another. We can sing hymns. And a common response in times of fear is the scripture we already read, Psalm 23. It's a wonderful, rich spiritual resources in times like this. Psalm 23 is one of the lectionary texts for this week. And for any of you watching who aren't familiar, the lectionary is sort of like the schedule of scripture readings for the church calendar. And the lectionary, in its great wisdom, put Psalm 23 right here in the middle of Lent. Lent, after all, is a time where we consider our missteps, we contemplate our mortality, we acknowledge the deserts of our lives, those times when things seem to be dry. It's a time, no matter the circumstances, where Psalm 23 is appropriate. However, to quote a tweet I saw this week, I didn't plan on giving up quite this much for Lent. And so Psalm 23 is particularly well-timed this Sunday. Now, many of us, were familiar with Psalm 23. Some of us even know it by heart. But I want us to walk through it this morning, taking a close look at the deep wisdom that the psalm has to offer us. Psalm 23 is a psalm of trust and confidence. It's written from the perspective of someone who has seen the best and worst that life has to offer, and has also seen God be present throughout all of it. It's actually attributed to David, who certainly saw highs and lows, who had mountaintop experiences and valleys, and had God's presence with him every step of the way. This psalm, it speaks to God's abiding love for us, a love that is present even in times of absence. And this is a time of absence. We're absent right now from one another's physical presence. 
So it is good on this Sunday to be reminded that God's love is always present to us. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. God makes me lie down in green pastures. God leads me beside still waters. God is first in the psalm compared to a shepherd. And as a shepherd, which is a famous image, right? We see so many paintings and renderings of God and Jesus as a shepherd. The job of a shepherd, God as shepherd, both leads and protects. God as a shepherd leads us, right? Our faith gives us morals, ethics, guidelines for how to live, how to treat one another, how to be human, how to live abundantly and graciously. And God as shepherd also protects. Now that doesn't mean that bad things won't happen, but it does promise that we're not alone in that difficulty. God protects us from being alone with our fear. God restores my soul. God leads me in right paths for God's name's sake. I won't lie, my soul needed a little bit of restoration this week. I was feeling scared and dry and bored. I needed restoration. So I really committed myself to things that I know help restore my soul. Things like my prayer time, yoga practice, connecting with some of you in our conference call Bible study. I took a walk and I saw God in nature. All of these things were allowing God to restore my soul. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Here it is again, right? That do not fear. So here's what I really think about this verse. What I really think about all those verses, all those scriptures that tell us not to have fear. I think that the darkness doesn't change. But who we are in the darkness changes when we're in relationship with God. The darkness doesn't change, but who we are in the darkness changes when we're in relationship with God. Darkness happens. All of us walk through the valley of the shadow of death at one point or another. The reality of pain and fear, it doesn't change. But by being with God, being in relationship with God, we change. We change and we recognize that we're not on our own. We change and we become less focused on just ourselves. We change and we learn to love our neighbor. And my goodness, if there were a time to really radically love our neighbors, this is it. That's the whole point of social distancing, right? What we're doing right now. It's to protect our neighbors, to protect the people that we know, and to protect people we might never meet. We change and we take courage in the stories of all of those people that have come before. We change and we open our eyes to the reality that God is still here in the darkness. We change and we start to see the stars that are still there, the moments of joy that can still be found in these times. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. The darkness doesn't change. We change. The psalm continues. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. At the end of the psalm, the characterization shifts. God is now a host hosting this banquet to which all are invited and there is abundance. God as a host comforts and feeds all of us. And here is the last piece of the song. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in God's house forever. Oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. 
Unfortunately, the English translation here isn't ideal. It should actually read, surely goodness and mercy will pursue me all the days of my life. You see, where once there was pursuit by enemies, here at the end of the psalm, there's pursuit by God's goodness and mercy. Can we believe that? Can we believe this morning that God's goodness and mercy are pursuing us even now? Can we see that God's goodness is running along behind us, just waiting to throw its arms around us, to be with us, to comfort us? God's love will pursue us right into the darkness and will never let us be alone. The darkness doesn't change. The darkness comes. All of us will feel fear at one point or another. The darkness doesn't change, but we change. We change through relationship with God. We become stronger, we become braver, and fear no longer consumes us. And we come to rest in the goodness and mercy and ever-present love of our God and our Savior. Will you pray with me? God, on this day, help us to feel your love. Help us to be filled with it. Let us feel you anointing our heads and filling our cups until they run over. God, many of us are scared. We lift that up to you, knowing that you are a God that can handle anything that we bring to you, our fear, our anxiety, our worry. God, we lift up the people who are we are scared for, our doctors and nurses and the many medical professionals, those who are vulnerable, those who have immune systems that might be weakened. We lift up those who are in positions of leadership. We ask that you guide them and give them wisdom and honesty and clarity so that they might do what is right. God, give each of us individually courage as we spend days in social isolation. Help us to find moments of joy and laughter and connection in the midst of this. God, we might not see it yet, but help us to find those stars that are there in the darkness. Help us to connect to people that we haven't connected to in a while. Help us to take a moment to rest if we haven't had that in a while. Help us to hear your voice, which is still speaking to us each and every day. God, let us know that it is okay to feel our feelings, but also help us to not be controlled by feelings of fear or anxiety. Help us instead to be led by what we Claim as true your ever-present love. God, we don't know how long this will last, but we know that in time it will come to an end. And God, when it does, let us throw open our arms in rejoicing and being able to gather together once again. We ask all of this in your son's name, the good shepherd himself. Amen.